Hi, everybody. My name is Janella Baxter. I am a philosopher of science with a special focus on biology and technology. Generally, my work investigates the role that technology plays in generating new scientific knowledge. But I also work on social, political, and ethical issues concerning the use of technology to solve real world problems. The talk that I will be giving for the Biological Engineering Collaboratory's virtual workshop in a few weeks is titled, When is it safe to edit the human germline? In 2013, scientists announced the development of a cutting edge, exciting new tool, the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing tool. This technology enables scientists to target and rearrange the nucleic acid sequences of almost any gene that they wish. And moreover, it's a tool that can be used in a broad range of living systems, including humans. Now, almost immediately after the announcement of this tool, scientists, philosophers, historians, and activists came out to voice a concern regarding one particular use of this tool, namely the use of germline modification in early stage human embryos. So human germline gene modification has a unique ethical status that other gene editing applications lack. And that's because modifying the germline means that any genetic change that's introduced through say CRISPR-Cas9 will be not only inherited by that future person's um, cells, all of their cells that they develop throughout their life, but that any change that's introduced by means of this intervention also has a probability of being inherited by that person's future offspring. Now, human germline gene editing is very promising and interesting to many scientists because it may be used to prevent certain kinds of genetic diseases for which we have no other alternative effective treatment or cure. Such an example might be Huntington's disease. Nevertheless, human germline gene editing raises a host of social, political, and ethical concerns, everything ranging from the rise of the new eugenics movement to safety issues to the exacerbation of existing social and economic inequalities. At least for some of these reasons, many prominent scientists have come out and advocated, at least informally, for a temporary ban on the use of this technique. A temporary ban prohibits the use of human germline gene editing for clinical uses, but it does not prohibit the use for non-clinical research purposes. In a clinical use, human germline gene editing is performed on an early stage human embryo where that embryo is allowed, is then implanted in, in a uterus and allowed to develop fully. Currently, the informal policy of the scientific community is that that should not be allowed at the moment, partly because of safety issues. However, non-clinical research use of human germline gene editing involves the modification of the germline of an early stage embryo, where that embryo is only permitted to survive within a very, very narrow and legally defined time period. For many countries, it's 14 days, after which the genetically modified human embryo is destroyed. The hope for many scientists is that with further non-clinical research, better developments and improvements on the te technique can be advanced so that one day it will be safe for clinical uses. But unfortunately, and this is an argument that Stefan Göttinger makes in a 2019 paper, non-clinical research is really not is really unlikely to enable researchers to develop a technique that will mitigate the possible risks associated with unintended consequences of human germline gene editing. And that's because biology is really complicated. So the relationship between the genotype and phenotype is immensely complex. 
and gene functions turn on and off over developmental stages and in different tissues. And epigenetic factors respond to environmental signals as a way to regulate the expression of certain genes in a particular way. All, what, all, what this means is that the, the long-term consequences of human germline gene editing on human embryos is not something that we will be able to observe within that very restricted time period that non-clinical research is permitted. So if, and this is a big if, if the public deems human germline gene editing a worthy medical intervention that you know is worthy developing into a clinical technique then that means that clinical trials are likely to be needed in other words in order to make human germline gene editing into a safe clinical application unsafe clinical trials will need to be carried out and so my talk is concerned with laying out the necessary social, political, and epistemic conditions that need to be met for clinical trials to be per performed responsibly and safely. Again, that is presupposing that the public decides that human germline gene editing is a worthwhile um, pursuit. And so my view consists of two main components. The first component has to do with the social, with a social and political consensus on what, if any, physiological states warrant human germline gene editing. And so what I'll argue is that clinical trials for human germline gene editing have the potential to perpetuate ableist, classist, and racist systems of thought and uh, social arrangements. And so as a way to manage that potential social harm, I argue that one of the first things that need to be met is that a diverse representative, a diverse governing body with representatives from the public needs to come together and reach a consensus on what, if any, physiological states warrant subjecting future individuals to the harms associated with human germline gene editing. The second component of my view has to do with what scientists need to know in order to perform human germline gene editing in the safest possible way. And so I argue that um, there needs to be consensus from uh, scientists who um, come from diverse areas of research on two main things. First, there needs to be consensus on what the genetic determinants are of a disease or what genetic determinants um, can be the candidates for human germline gene editing. And that secondly, there needs to be consensus on what nucleic acid sequences will replace the disease-causing genetic determinants. And in outlining these conditions, what my epistemic conditions show is that there can be consensus on one of those conditions, but not the other. So sci the scientific community can agree on what the genetic determinants of a disease are, but disagree on what nucleic acid sequence should replace the disease-causing genetic determinants with. And so what I hope to argue is that it's simply not adequate to frame our research policy on this issue in terms of a monogenetic complex disease distinction that has been popular in the literature. Instead, I advocate that we abandon that literature or that distinction and instead frame our research policy for human germline gene editing in terms of the two epistemic conditions that I outlined. Finally, I want to note that it may be that few, if any, diseases satisfy all of the conditions that I outline in this work. And if that's the case, so much the worse for human germline gene editing. It may just be that human germline gene editing is not safe for clinical trials ever. And if that's the case, that's fine. My aim in this work is not to argue that human germline gene editing is or is not safe or um, sufficiently um, sufficient for clinical trials, 
but rather just to specify what conditions need to be met for it to be wielded safely. The rest is up for the community to decide. And that's it. Thank you. I'll see you in a few weeks.